Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. It is your host, as always, Michael Shermer. This episode is brought to you by Wondrium. You've heard me talk about it a lot. I love the company. It's my favorite company for consuming content while you're on the road or busy at home doing chores or whatever. I listen to Wondrium courses when I'm driving, cycling, hiking, dog, etc. cetera. Uh, it's just a great way to multitask and learn. I consider myself an autodidact. Yes, I went to college and so forth, but uh, it doesn't, learning doesn't stop there. It continues and should continue for the rest of your life. Why not? Wondrium is the place to go. It's a subscription service. So you sign up for the subscription and then you get access to all their great content online. And if you do it through the show, you get half off, 50% off the first three months of the uh, yearly subscription. So check it out at wondrium.com slash Shermer. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M.com slash S-H-E-R-M-E-R. For example, here's a course uh, that I was just scrolling through. Ancient Civilizations of North America. Now I know about some of this because I live in Southern California, so I've explored uh, many of the uh, Anastasi ruins in the Southwestern United States, but there's much, much more to that. Uh, I'll just rifle through a few of these lectures. The first human migrations to the Americas. Oh, I learned a lot about that in my preparation of debating um, Graham Hancock on Joe Rogan's podcast uh, because um, Graham thinks that people came to America tens of thousands of years before what mainstream archaeologists think, so pretty interesting. Clovis Man, America's first culture. Of course, people challenge that. Not just the alternative archaeologists, but a lot of archaeologists think Clovis first, uh, not a viable hypothesis anymore, but we'll see what they say. Uh, let's see. P- uh, poverty paint, North Americans first clay. Okay. Um, medicine wheels. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the origin of Mississippian culture. Okay. I have not been to those sites, but I've seen pictures of them, documentaries on them, and so on. Mississippian city of. Uh, however you pronounce that. We'll just skip that. The wide Mississippian world. Uh, let's see. I get to the Anastasi, the ancestral Puebla. Oh yeah, there we go. Chaco, uh, Chaco phenomena. I've been to Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. It's just totally phenomenal. Their structures that they built. Archaeoastronomy. I love archaeoastronomy. My friend at the uh, Griffith Park Observatory who directs it there. Uh, is a professional archaeo astrono- astronomer. That is, you study these ancient sites and interpret how the people would have interpreted the sky. Anyway, check it out, wondrium.com slash Shermer. You get 50% off and you get access to, well, that course or hundreds of others. It's just great. All right, thanks for listening. Let's get started. My guest today is Dr. Iris Barent, a professor of psychology at Northeastern University in Boston and director of the Language and Mind Lab. Barron's research has examined how the mind works and how we think it does. <laughs> These are two different things. <laughs> She's the author of dozens of groundbreaking scientific publications and the recipient of numerous research grants. Her previous book, The Phonological Mind, from Cambridge University Press, was hailed by none other than Steven Pinker as a brilliant and fascinating analysis of how we produce and interpret sound. Her new book, relatively new, about a year old now, is this uh, uh, title here, the Blind Storyteller, How We Reason About Human Nature. I discovered Iris when I read her op-ed a couple weeks ago in the Los Angeles Times. Here, here is how she opens that op-ed, and you can see why it got my attention here. In the past months, a growing choir of popular media has voice in passion concerns with the so-called innateness dogma. These critiques question the possibility that females are instinctively maternal, that biological sex, a notion distinct from gender, is binary, and that biology shapes society, as argued by the late E.O. Wilson's sociobiology. At the root of the anxiety, however, are not the technical scientific merits of these proposals, but their social consequences, their potential to elicit harm and perpetrate uh, injustice. Now, these concerns have moved to curbing the scientific process itself, which I assume is what triggered this you to write this up in, in a recent editorial in the journal Human, Na- Human Nature, Human Behavior, one of the most prominent journals in this area, uh, the editors have stated that they may request modifications or, in severe cases, refuse publication of, quote, content that is premised upon the assumption of inherent biological, social, or cultural superiority 
or inferiority of one human group over another. And then you write in the last uh, sentences I'll read here, the editorial is no doubt well intended and at first blush reasonable. Indeed, the notion of inherent cultural differences is not only morally objectionable, but also conceptually bankrupt. But inherent biological differences, uh, the topic of much active research, is a different matter. In fact, there is evidence that individual differences in IQ, reading, and musical skills are heritable. In the eyes of some, however, this research is socially harmful. <laughs> wow, so you, uh, Iris, have jumped right into the fray here. This is a huge controversial topic. Uh, so before we dive into the actual science behind it and the science behind the study of this of the science, uh, give us a little bit of background, uh, how you got into studying psychology and what uh, drew, drew you to the study of human nature and all its controversial aspects. Well, I was originally interested in human nature. That's really what drew me to psychology. Actually, I was a music major in, in, in my training. I wasn't even a psychologist. But um, through the lens of music, I was interested in this idea that um, is there something that shapes all musical systems that renders them similar to each other as it seemed the case? Um, and I thought uh, this is an empirical question and one needs to go to the lab and figure out those things. And I started in music and went to language. Um, and then I was interested in why people think that this question of innateness is so problematic, which got me to uh, where I am now. Right. So um, what are some of your scientific interests you study, uh, I, I gather from the book. And by the way, let me just note that um, I've often uh, uh, quoted Steve Pinker's book, uh, cited Steve Pinker's book, The Blank Slate, as the best treatise on the subject. I have to say mm -hmm. yours is 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 now uh, up there with me <laughs> in terms of recommendations. It's the best book. That, that book was written back in the early 2000s, I think 2004. And you've really updated a lot of the science, but also it's a compliment to Pinker's book, The Blank Slate, because it, you also talk about how we reason about the blank slate or human nature. Um, so maybe that's that's a place to begin. What kind of research do, do, do you and your lab do on that subject? On how we reason about human nature? Yeah. So we really do both, right? So, so there is, I've started with this research on trying to understand human nature through the channel of language, and which is um, you know, a quintessential uh, case. And, as I was communicating these results to friends and colleagues and cocktail parties, um, I noticed this response that people were giving me. They were kind of giving me the look. And it took me many years to figure out what the look was about. At first, I thought, well, maybe I'm not clear enough. Maybe I need to explain it better. But it, with time, I realized that the problem that they had is really in the question rather than the answer that I was giving them. What they thought is that the question itself, the possibility that there are uh, innate principles that we are born knowing stuff, that uh, strikes them as unreasonable. And once I was able to put this to words, then I thought, okay, you know, I'm a cognitive scientist. Let's see first, A, is this a thing? Do people really have this bias? Are they empiricist? And second, why that's the case? Um, and that's uh, you know, uh, gave rise to a research program that I'm doing right now. Right. So would an example of this be your own accent? I, 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 I detect an accent. I don't know what it yes. is, but I presume, I presume I your think... children do not have that accent? No. Yeah. So we are a trilingual household. My children uh, speak, so Hebrew is my native language. They speak Hebrew to me. They speak Spanish to my husband. Uh, they only speak Hebrew to the cat, of which I am very uh, proud of. <laughs> That's funny. And no, absolutely. but that would <clears throat> that would be an example of nature nurture interacting, right? That yeah, you got imprinted on your particular accent at a certain age, and that's it. You have it for life. Your children can speak the same language, but they're not going to have the same accent because they have a different culture. And mm -hmm. They're born and raised here, I presume, in America. And so language would be maybe our first dip into what this problem is. That is, how do you tease apart nature and nurture? Uh, you call these, you know, you know, it's kind of cultural, what did you call them? Cultural, um, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, the notion of inherent cultural differences is morally bankrupt, but, but the idea of a blank slate would be equally morally, or just sort of conceptually bankrupt. Right, because the environment has to act on some machinery. It's not, you know, it's not an empty yeah. 
goal. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't see any uh, conflict between the two. So um, the editorial by nature human behavior assumed that um, the, the notion of inherent, dif- they, it's their term. And, and it's a very confusing editorial because they object to the notion of, so they're saying, if a scientist makes the assumption that there are inherent differences between groups, then we have the right to reject it. Now, the question is, A, what do you mean by assumption? If you go to the lab and demonstrate that, is it a, a hypothesis? Well, if you make an assumption and you don't uh, test it and you provide no evidence for that, then you should reject the paper because it's a bad paper, not because of any other reason. Likewise, uh, the, the way they define those differences between groups, they put in the same basket differences that are cultural. So claiming that there are inherent differences, so actually, I should say that the second uh, vague uh, notion, there is the notion of inherent. So what do you mean by inherent? I assume probably innate, although they don't want to use this word. So if you assume that there are innate cultural differences now, I don't know what you're talking about. Again, this is just a, doesn't make sense. Um, you don't need the editorial to justify rejecting this paper, this paper. So the question is, are you really talking about inherent, presumably innate differences um, that are uh, in general, which has a genetic basis, um, are you going to reject papers that claims that psychological differences between individuals are innate? Uh, I think this is highly problematic if that's where this is going. Yeah, well, that is where it's going inevitably, even if they don't intend it to be that. Although it's kind of understandable, I guess, the use of or misuse of biology in the name of some ideology has a mm-hmm. pretty dark history. So, but we're long past the eugenics movement and the Nazis and all that stuff. So, why is it rearing up again now? I mean, we kind of went through the the sociobiology evolutionary psychology wars in the '90s, and they largely were triumphant. The evidence is just overwhelming that we have an evolved nature mm-hmm. on which culture operates mm-hmm. in in you know in, in an interactive effect. And so what? Why, you know, why, why now? I, uh, you know, my research does not allow me to answer this question. I can only speculate. I don't have the professional background to address it. I haven't done so. I can imagine that there might be a link between climate change, between the pressures that it puts on migration and therefore to the uh, sense of uh, threat that some people feel because of the migration and those things kind of combined together. What I can bring to the mix is this notion of um, when people uh, uh, object to the notion of human nature, their objections might in part be sparked by external cultural and, and political and social situation. It may also uh, the the way it may also be sparked by the way we reason about innateness generally. So the question is, um, is there something in how the mind works that renders the notion of um, innate difficulties particularly difficult for humans? Uh, innate. I'm sorry. Let me rephrase. Are, uh, is there something in the human mind that renders the notion of uh, innate differences between individuals? Um, particularly um, uh, difficult for us to grasp. Hmm. Go back to the language example. Um, all humans learn languages. Which one you learn and what accent you pick up depends on the culture in which you're, sure. you're raised in. So obviously that's interactive. But the moment, and that's relatively politically neutral, I think. If, but if you say women are, uh, have a maternal instinct, you mm-hmm. can see how, say, conservatives, Christian conservatives, would use that and say, aha, well, so it's it fixed in their nature. Mm-hmm. You really belong in the home, raising children. That's what you mm-hmm. should be doing. You shouldn't be in the workplace, and so on and so on and so right. on. So I can, I, yeah. yeah. So maybe that's what's behind it, something like that. Yeah, and if you're liberal, you're equally offended. So yeah, no, it's a kind of forms. When, yeah. But, but what if there is a maternal instinct? I mean, whether there is or not, or to what extent there might be, on average, differences between men and women on their propensity to want to spend a lot of time with an infant, um, even if there is an average, it, it is whatever it is, right? The science right. says whatever the science says, regardless of what somebody in the political sphere may 
do with that information? Yeah, so I think that the question and what I tried to raise in the op-ed is the question of why do we perceive harm in those claims? So why is a claim, so putting aside the question of whether the hypothesis of maternal instinct is correct or not, let's assume it is for the moment. Why by merely suggesting that people find it offensive, whereas saying that you know, women are predisposed to breast cancer because of a certain gene, right? That is not considered offensive. And in fact, we now recognize that it's uh, uh, essential to uh, look for these differences in order to deliver care. So why is it the psychological innateness that people find so offensive? And my claim is people find it offensive because they think it makes no sense. And therefore, if you make a frivolous claim like that, then you must be a bigot, right? Because there cannot possibly be a scientific basis to argue that there are innate differences in something like maternal instinct. So if it's clear to us that this is a nonsensical claim and you're still making it, then you are indeed eliciting harm. My claim in this op-ed is that the harm is not coming from the science because what the science is, that people are attribute to the science, all kinds of claims that science actually does not make. And it is our interpretations that come from how our mind works that color uh, those perceptions. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, the responsibility for that lies not on the science, but rather on the human mind. And therefore, it's the role of scientists to help individuals recognize, um, A, what the science is actually saying, and B, what we incorrectly project into the science. Yeah, exactly. And the rest in your book actually deals with that in great depth. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, let me just punctuate this point that I repeat endlessly, and it can't be repeated enough. Whatever the science says is irrelevant to the rights of women to have equal opportunity in the workplace. It doesn't matter if it's 100% genetic for maternal instincts or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. You should be free yep. to do whatever you want. Yep. Uh, no obstacles, right? Yep. So, and, and you know, I say this with the trans movement. It wouldn't matter if it's 10%, 1%, 0.01%, one person on the planet. Right. Uh, trans rights are human rights. And you know, we have to separate that from whatever the science says. And this is where we get into trouble. People yep. want the science to come out a certain way because they feel like if it doesn't, if the numbers aren't big enough, then uh, there's going to be bigotry and rights violations and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you can you know, turn the argument on its head and say, if we recognize our innate individual differences, then we can ensure equity because we can compensate the people who need of, uh, additional help and make sure that they get this help, just as we ought to do the same in the case of healthcare. Exactly. Let me, um, one of the things I liked about your book is your writing is very clear. And so I found this passage here in your first chapter, kind of outlining the thesis of the book. Here in a nutshell is the gist of what I will argue. You can see why that popped out. Oh, okay. She's going to tell us what this book is about. <laughs> I like that. I believe that our resistance to innate ideas is but one of many examples of our blindness to our own human nature. And I suggest that all of these cases of self-blindness arise from the collision between two titanic forces that are buried deep in our psyches. Both ironically are likely to be innate ideas. I like that meta on top of meta. Uh, the first is our instinctive belief in dualism, the notion that our minds are immaterial, distinct, and separable from our material bodies. The other is our deep-seated belief in essentialism, the idea that living things are each defined by some innate, immutable, and necessarily material essence. I've recently introduced these. Well, then you get into the details. So let's just start there. What, uh, define what you mean by human nature and then dualism and then essentialism, and then we can deconstruct each of those. Human nature is the belief that... Uh the way we are is uh, 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 innately determined. Um, that uh, so, I think this uh, uh, you, you know makes it perhaps easier for people to grasp when it comes to um, personality traits or to emotions. But the claim is that it's not only our emotion; it's only not all, uh, our personality. It includes the possibility that there are some stuff that we know innately. Uh, that there are there is such thing as innate knowledge. Okay, <clears throat> and then dualism. Uh, 
Dualism is the belief that the mind is separate from the body, and we're talking about an intuitive belief that even very young children showed, as opposed to Descartes' uh, doctrine. Right. And then essentialism. Essentialism is, is the belief that we are who we are because we have some inherent essence, right? So if you ask a child, uh, why is a dog brown like its mother? And the answer that is telling you is, there must be something that is a little piece of matter that the doggy got from its mother, and that's what determines what it is. It will never change. That determines its essence. So there is some hidden essence that makes living things what they are. Right. So, okay, let's uh, dive into these. The resistance to the idea that we have a human nature, as you, you've mentioned, can be politicized. So that's one reason. But but I think what you're saying is that um, it doesn't feel intuitively like we have a nature. We feel like there's a spirit soul thing floating around up there called the mind or my body has a soul that floats off when I die and go somewhere else. That's my essence. And that feels very flexible. Like there's no nature to it. I can make myself whatever I want. That, is that what you're arguing? There's this kind of an evolved intuitive psychology, a folk psychology about our natures. So this is not evolved. I don't think that our, in, so let's narrow down the discussion because talking about yeah. human nature, it's a very broad claim. Let's talk about the notion of innate knowledge specifically. So when you ask lay people, what do you think newborns know? Do they have a sense of object? So if they're going to see an object that disintegrates in midair, like the Challenger disaster, if they were to see that for the first time, would they find it surprising? Would they know that that's not how objects behave? Would they know that objects you know, only move when they are contacted by another object, right? Um, when you ask these questions of lay people, they tell you there is no way that a newborn has this uh, understanding. And of course, we're talking about uh, tacit subconscious understanding. It's all completely under the hood. But by the infant's behavior, the infants can show you that they know this stuff. So if you ask lay people, will infants show, the, demonstrate knowledge of that? Will they be surprised, demonstrably surprised when they see an impossible event? And people tell you, no way, this is not possible. And basically, they're assuming that um, the, there's no way that this knowledge can possibly be innate in this infant. So it's preci precise, specifically the notion of innate knowledge that people find very unlikely and, and, and um, you know, uh, confusing. Right. So <clears throat> like at Paul Bloom's lab with uh, the infant's showing a little um, puppet show mm -hmm. where one puppet is trying to push this ball up a ramp, I think it was, and the other yep. puppet comes in and either helps it or arms it and pushes pushes the ball back down, is either being cooperative or, or not. The infants know Im immediately. They're attracted to the cooperative one. They reward the cooperative one. They punish, slap down, or push away the, the, not, the naughty puppet that was not helpful. Right. And so the interpretation of that is what? That babies are born with a sense of, I don't know, right and wrong, or this is a good person, this is a bad person? Prefer to good guys to bad guys in a very rudimentary sense. That's what it seems to suggest. This is just a description of what they're reflecting in their behavior. So I, won't, I wouldn't say morality in general, but rudimentary hmm. notion of good and bad. So preferring helpers to hinderers, as they describe it. Right. So where would that come from if, if it's if they're too young to learn, they don't even have language yet, it has to be an evolved propensity. That would be part of nature. We're, we're given this as part of our right. hardware. Right, right. And in the case of what is an object, in fact, so A, you see it in newborns. This has been shown in newborn, human newborns. And you also see it in other species. So we have an evolutionary history there that we know uh, makes it even more likely to suggest that these capacities are innate. So, yeah, the the these specific innate ideas that we seem to have seem to come innately to us. Yep. So uh, part of the package as homo sapiens, you can teach a chimp all the sign language you want, but their capacity for communication via sign language is very limited compared mm -hmm. to human language. Right. Right. 
exactly. Yeah. And and so uh, there are certain things that we do because we not know we can't fly, we can walk, and uh, <laughs> there are certain things that we know by virtue of our uh, human genome. Right. So um, with dualism, um, are you arguing that it's it, we're kind of I think P Paul Bloom used the term we're natural born dualists. You yeah. know, babies. It, if the it, if the alligator puppet munches the little mouse puppet, and then you know the, you ask them where's the mouse puppet? Oh, it's off with its mommy now, and it's lonely or whatever, it's hungry. They they still they think that that the little mouse that's dead is still somewhere. Yeah, its essence continues yeah. on. Well, Paul Bloom wrote this another wonderful book uh, by Paul Bloom is called The Cards Babies, in which he made the claim that we are in fact inherently dualist and. Uh, it's not because you know we are dualism uh, has any um, evolutionary advantage. Obviously, it does not. But rather, we are likely inherently dualist because of an unfortunate accident. The unfortunate accident is the fact that, on the one hand, we have innate knowledge of what objects are and what they behave, and we think that objects, for instance, only move by contact; they can't move spontaneously. On the other hand, we have understanding of what people are and how they behave. And you know that a person has goals and ideas, and you have a theory about the minds of, the, of others. And you know that people do not need to uh, obey uh, intuitive physics. So they don't need to move only if somebody comes and bumps into me. I can just decide that I come and, and move by, this, by myself. So people in, in, intuitively and spontaneously explain the behavior of agents, of people, and of objects by different principles, and the thing that agents can violate intuitive physics, I can come and move by it myself. And it's this tension between these two core systems, that is, of intuitive physics and theory of mind, that leads us to become dualists. So this is just an unfortunate consequence of these two systems of core knowledge, rather than, you know, an active selection for it. I don't think that would make sense. Hmm. So just a byproduct of our cognition, just the way the, the hardware is wired up. Yep. Yeah. Of the specific innate systems of cognition that we're equipped with. Yeah. Yeah. I often think of it sometimes as the, the fact that the brain does not detect itself operating. So the schizophrenic that hears voices and their auditory tracks are active, they hear the voices out there, not, mm -hmm. not in here, right? Mm -hmm. The person that has a sense presence, you know, I wrote about these these uh, solo climbers and sailors and so forth that are out there by themselves for days on end, and they uh, they sense somebody else in, in the tent with them or on the ropes with them or whatever you're doing, and they talk to them, they have a conversation with this imaginary person, and so on. To them, it's very real. We know it's oxygen deprivation or fatigue or sleep deprivation or whatever that's triggering this brain chemistry changes, but the brain doesn't detect itself making those changes so it can only interpret it as out there, mm -hmm. right? So that uh, in part explains, I think in part explains dualism. It just feels like I have a mind floating around up there and I don't sense my brain doing anything. I don't even yeah. really know I have a brain unless I actively think about it. Yeah, cognition is full of illusions of any kind, you know, visual illusions, linguistic illusions. We, what we know is how our mind projects things to us. You don't need to be a schizophrenic to show those projections. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, this is why I always liked uh, Oliver Sacks' books, because it, it showed when things go wrong mm -hmm. in the brain, that's where right. we can tell, oh, that's what was going on in that spot there that's now dead from a tumor or a stroke or whatever. Uh, you kind of back engineer what how the brain is working when it's not working properly. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned... Um, Okay, theory of mind. Oh, do, let's let's talk about dualism a little so, bit more. So we're building I, the storm, right? Yep. Yes. We yeah. are building the perfect storm for your right. listeners. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But please continue. Jump in if you have some more thoughts on that. So, so shall I? Do you want me to try to introduce that to to build please. it up for you? Okay. Yes, please. So, please. Uh, so. We talked about essentialism. So when we reason about innateness, we are consulting intuitive essentialism. When we're thinking why the dog is the way it is, we're saying, oh, it has this essence that lies in the body. 
when we think about why a person is the way it, they are, we also think about there must be some inherent essence that they have that lies in the body. The problem, though, is that when we think about a person, we don't think only of a body. We also think about a mind. As we said, we are also dualists. And we think that what we know is not in the body, but rather it's somewhere else. It's some, something ephemeral that is part of the mind. So the problem is, if we think that what's innate is in the body, but we think that there is some stuff that is outside the body and knowledge is outside the body, then knowledge cannot be innate. It is in the wrong place for being innate according to what our intuitive cognition tells us. And that's how people become empiricists. Hmm. Right. So even in the language we use, like, like if I say, well, I, I hurt my arm. Uh, well, I am my arm. I am my body. I, there, there's no me and then the arm, like they're separate, right? It, mm -hmm. But it's hard not to say that, uh, you know, whatever. Or even I, I thought of a re recent example of this with the trans movement where some people are saying, I, I feel like I'm in the wrong body. Mm -hmm. Well, that's dualism, right? I mean, it, there is no you and your body. You're just your body. It, the whole thing is all one package. It's a It's monism, not dualism, but intuitively... It feels like a dualistic system. There's two different things going on there. I, you know, I, I think we need to separate things. So I think that when people say that, what they mean is they mean below the, the body, below the, the head, so to speak, right? So, so there mm. is a coherent notion that a trans person refers to. But um, if you ask, where is the self? Uh, and is it part of the mind or is it part of the body? Um, we actually have done some research on that. And the answer is, it's really confusing because it's really both. So, um, yeah, the, the, but there, it, there is, in fact, a notion of the self that is outside the body. That is why so many cultures believe in the afterlife. It's something that you find in extremely prevalent across cultures that there are some, um, uh, you know, supernatural beings uh, that we continue to persist after death. There are all kinds of gods and, and, and so forth. Yeah. So this is something that for a dualist, that's exactly what you would expect. Right. It feels like myself, however that's defined, all my memories, all my thoughts, my point of view, looking out through my eyes, mm -hmm. that entity. Uh, if you say, well, imagine it doesn't exist anymore. I can't. Is to imagine something, you have to be alive, sentient, aware. And so if you, it's like saying, stop being aware. Well, how do you know, concentrate on being non-concentrating or concentrate on not on unawareness? I, I, I don't even know how you do that. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I wonder if you think it's just impossible to imagine not existing. Once you exist, that's it. And when you're not, when you're no longer existing, you're not imagining anything, wondering, oh, this is what it's well, like to be dead. <laughs> we, we ask people this question in the lab, and we ask them, so tell us which of the following traits, psychological traits, are likely to exist in the afterlife. And we give them some things that describe what you know, and other things that describe your emotions, and other things that describe, you know, you can sit and walk. And what they're telling us, and we're telling them, well, we don't know whether the afterlife exists, but tell us what you think. Suppose it exists. What is going to persist? People think that the stuff that you know will persist, more likely so uh, than the stuff that, you know, your emotions and your actions. So what you connect readily to the body, you think that emotions are somewhere in your face, you think that sitting is in your legs. Um, therefore, you think that, well, if the body is gone, then these things will go on, but the mind is not, and knowledge is in the mind. Therefore, it can persist in the afterlife. So that's part of our intuitive dualist cognition. Mm -hmm. And again, you think this is more likely a byproduct of the hardware rather than an evolved adaptation. You know, there's some people that speculate belief in the afterlife is an adaptive feature because then it reduces anxiety about, um, you know, the awareness of death and that sort of thing. It might, it might be, but I think you don't need to go there. I think you can uh, explain dualism just by the two other, by the two, by that adaptiveness of its engines. And the engines of dualism, as Pablo suggested, is intuitive physics on the one hand and theory of mind on the other. 
um, and it's um, each of those systems is only adaptive. It's only adaptive for a child to know, you know, what is an object is, what is the body of their mother. Look at their mother as a, a single uh, entity, as opposed to say, if you only see my torso now, know that I also, you know, if if you saw my legs separately, that it's the same person. That is certainly adaptive. It's also adaptive to understand that people read the minds of others and to uh, reason about how it makes it, what makes me behave. So those are the adaptive things that you need to assume. You don't need anything else to explain how dualism arises. Mm, right. You write about in the book um, uh, the uh, the mirror test, you know, Rama's uh, mirror test with uh, patients that have lost an arm and they still sense that the arm is there. And people even that are whole with two two arms, but you put the uh, mirror box in there and you have the rubber arm and you right. brush the little rubber arm and pretty soon they, they feel as if they can sense that. Mm -hmm. So that would, impl it, it, assuming you know, uh, the patient without an arm, so th the sense I have right now of like moving my fingers and I can see in space where my hand is, that isn't here. It's, it's up here. It's somewhere in the neural tracts going up there in the brain itself. We are what our brain tells us. Right. So what do you need a body for? The brain is the body. <laughs> right. Yes. They're so integrated. You can't separate them. Well, I'm just curious about this stuff because I wrote, I wrote this, uh, a book about this, Heavens on Earth, about the scientific attempts to achieve immortality. Hmm. And, you know, the idea of mind uploading or chronically frozen or whatever. But the, the mind uploading seems to be the most popular one now. So... My question is, is what's getting uploaded? How do you do that? Yeah, what, what's the trick? How do you upload the mind? Well, the, the, the theory is that you, uh, it's called the connectome, right? We're gonna, uh -huh. like the genome, we're gonna copy every single synaptic connection in your brain, all trillions of them, you know, giant computer, and just basically copy the file. It'll be a digital file. Then you upload it into the cloud and you turn it on and there you are, you're up there now, right? This is the theory. I, I think it's utter nonsense because uh, if we did this while you were still alive in, say, a sophisticated MRI brain scanner and then pulled you out after scanning you and say, hey, guess what? You're up in the cloud now. You're, you're standing there in the room next to the MRI machine go, looking through your eyes going, no, I'm not. I'm right here. This is me. Now, to the immortalists, these are the transhumanists. They, they are the singulitarians, people like Rakers. Well, uh, mm -hmm. they, they just say, well, you have to redefine the self. There's just two of you now. Um, but how would that be any different from identical twins? The, most, the moment you separate or in different environments and turn both systems on, you're leading different uh, life paths and you're going to have different memories and different experiences. However identical you try to make it, they're not going to be identical. Anyway, that's the theory. Well, well, putting aside the merits of this theory, which are very questionable to me, it is true psychologically that we think about ourselves in different terms. And it's not just a single self that we have in mind, but rather there are multiple notions of the self. So think about it. If you're on the one hand dualist and you think that um, what you really are is your mind, which is separate from the body, and it's this mind that's going, in fact, this, you can continue to exist without your body. So your, yourself, in some sense, is distinct from the body. You're also essentialist, however, so you believe that your true essence must be embodied. So there must be a notion of the self that is intimately linked to the body. And what it means is that you are really in trouble because you have two conflicting notions of the self, one that is embodied and one that is disembodied. And I'm talking about how we perceive ourselves rather than what the self really is. Yeah, I am curious, though, to know what you think the self really is. Maybe it's an illusion. Maybe we can't get at it. Um, because if I understand you, uh, you, your, your book, there is no permanent self because I'm constantly changing. I'm an infant, then I'm a child, then I'm a middle schooler, then I'm a high schooler, then I'm college. Now here I am 68. There's no place, it, 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 there's no point in time when you say that's the real Michael Shermer. There he is right there, <laughs> right? Which is my argument against the connectome. You know, you, the moment you copy and scan my connectome, well, that's just me that particular day, the next day I'm slightly different, but is there, is there not sort of a core essence of me, you know, my temperament, yeah. my personality, yeah. and it's relatively consistent through the lifespan? So people have asked this question 
So again, it's the question of how we perceive ourselves. I don't know to tell you what is the self, but how, what we, what is our intuitive psychology of who we are. And there is one body of literature that asks, who is the person, who is Michael really, right? So you're different now from when you were a child. Who is Michael truly? And the answer that comes from this literature is, A, people really believe that there is a true self that exists and persists despite all these physical changes. And second, this true self is linked to your morality. Of all the traits that can define Michael, it's your moral acts that are most important, that's your morality, and particularly it's the good act. So if you give people vignettes where a person changes either to the better or to the worse, and you ask them, okay, so tell us who is Michael really is. Is it the good guy or the bad guy? And they will tell you, no, it's the good guy. So not only do they define the truth, they distinguish the true self from the self. They think that there is a person who still remains there despite the, so concrete example, uh, you know, a corrupt policeman turned fine or the opposite, who is this person? And they say it's the, the good one who really um, represents the, the um, true self. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's how we, we seem to think about it. But then we also think about our essence, which is part of the body. So to flesh out the, the contrast between the two, there's a large literature that looks at how people reason about morality and about responsibility, say, in the legal system. And people think about morality as something that is part of the mind, not part of the body. So in fact, if you tell them they killed the person because there was something in the brain, then they um, this they think that the person is less responsible for their acts. They think that um, morality is part of the mind, not part of the body, and the true self aligns with the moral core, and therefore it's in the mind. But then people also think about the, you, there must be an essence of Michael that is part, lying hidden in your body. So there are really these two Michaels, the moral Michael, which is in the mind, which is good, which will maintain there. So in fact, people have asked a beautiful work about um, people have asked families of people with Alzheimer's, is the person still there? And as long as they're, the, pro, the, the person's good moral attributes are there, they still think that the person is, is, remains. So that is one answer to who you are. But then there's the other answer that says, no, there must be something lying in your body that explains your essence. And, and it's, um, yeah. Uh, so we are, uh, really have these two conflicting notions. Yeah, that's really interesting because, in, say, in a court case where somebody's committed a crime, they've embezzled or they, whatever they did, you know, the defense will say, well, that's not the real person. It was this mitigating circumstances. It was under stress or, you know, the Twinkie defense or, you know, there's something that nudged him off of his normal moral path. And this was an aberration. And so please go light. On them, of course, the prosecution's arguing just the opposite, right? That no, no, this is a tell of who this person really is. Uh, just take the Herschel Walker case, since this is recording this on October seventh. He's in the news every night for, you know, being pro-life uh, to the point of wanting to ban abortion under all circumstances. And it turns out he, you know, uh, paid for one of one of his mm -hmm. many uh, girlfriends' abortion, and has you know five children by five different women or whatever it is. And, you know, he's Mr. Family Values. Well, what does that even mean, right? So, the, you know, the debate is, you know, conservatives say, well, that's not the real him. This was some mitigating thing way back when. And other liberals are going, no, no, that's the real him, right? These are, these are clues about his true innate self. Or when somebody gets drunk, like a, you know, comedian and blurts out some racist comments on stage, like Michael Richards did, guy from Seinfeld. Or, um, you know, Mel Gibson gets pulled over by the Malibu police and he'd been drinking and he's ranting on about the Jews and, and women and stuff like that. And it's like, so the question is, is that the real Mel Gibson and the alcohol released it? That, so now we get to see what he's really like? Or is it the alcohol that just kind of mm -hmm. sent him down some path? Normally he's not a racist guy and he's a good guy or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know to answer this particular cases, but what I can tell you based on the literature that exists is um, people assume that it's actually, you know, as Anne Frank said, deep down we humankind is good. Um, funny that she said that, but yes.
it's astonishing. She said that. I love that you quote that in your book because, you know, given where she was in hiding yeah. from the Nazis yeah. and then was later murdered, yeah. uh, to have that kind of confidence in human nature. And yet uh, a lot of people are pretty pessimistic about that, right? That, uh, you know, the, the, the inner demons are the true human self. Um, this is called the, uh, I think Franz Duvall calls this the thin veneer theory of human nature, of which he accuses Richard Dawkins of having. That is, in Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene, as, as some people read it, that, you know, we're innately selfish and civilization is this like thin veneer kind of keeping the beast down. And then so Franz says, no, 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 it's actually we're good inside. And civilization is an extension of that goodness. You know, see, so again, along the lines of your research, it's kind of reflecting two different theories intuitive theories about human nature? You know, I don't know how to answer those questions of who we are really. Um, I find it more fruitful to ask who we think we are. Because yeah. a lot of the answer to who we are, what matters is what we think anyway. I, I, I mean, uh, I, I think that, um, so I, I choose to, uh, try to understand the lenses by which we look at our psychological reality rather than to ask what this reality is. I don't know that we can answer the question of what the reality really is. Well, if what you're saying is true, then we can't because it's all a story. You know, you're yeah. the, the, the blind storyteller. I'm telling a story. You're telling a story. The person that says, I know what the true self is. That's a story. And somebody else that says the true self is an illusion. There is no true self. That's a story. <laughs> so they're all stories. But the, I, I guess in yeah, science, no, what, what we want to know is... Yeah. True, exactly. And we have, so we can, we can uh, see what are the stories that we tell by using scientific methods and demonstrate that people do, in fact, construct certain narratives and identify what are the principles that guide those narratives. Beyond that, asking what's really out there, um, I think this is uh, partly a judgment call. And as a scientist, I don't feel prepared to answer it. No, but you surely must have an opinion, your own personal story. I mean, do you think there's a, a self, a you, a core essence of characteristics that l roughly speaking is a family resemblance idea of concepts, a concept of you? I don't know. I, and I don't care. I, I, what I care to know is what I think exists. I, I, um, I don't know. I mean, if you're, you know, a social psychologist, of course, you're going to define the self and, and, and build theories about what you think the self is. Uh, so, yes, that can be answered. Um, but this is not what I can tell you about. Hmm. I wonder if you, you might agree with somebody like Jordan Peterson's theory of truth as being pragmatic. It's what works. Truth is what works for a person. So if you say, well, I think the self is an illusion that works for me, or I believe in free will, even if I know the universe is determined, that story you tell yourself, I'm free and I make free moral choices and I, I hold myself accountable and I'm going to do the same with you. And I think that's how civilization should be structured, that we hold people morally accountable. Um, and, and you would say, well, that's one way to think about it. Yeah, but, it, but it's a kind of truth, right? Because it works. I don't know how far you'd, you'd I, like to go I, I don't know that I would feel comfortable in saying this is the truth, but I certainly think to say, you know, what we want to identify is, is pragmatic principles that guide our society and that we uh, hold each other responsible for them. Whether these are the truth or not, um, I'm not prepared to answer. Mm. And also reading your book, I was thinking about Richard Dawkins' idea of the middle land that we evolved on these plains of Africa in which everything was kind of a middling size, say, between ants and, and mountains. Uh, so perception, conceptions of atoms and molecules or galaxies and expanding universes and multiverses. I mean, there, it's so counterintuitive. Or speed, you know, so it's kind of middling speed perception. Our perceptual apparatus is designed to pick up things that move some, somewhere between the speed of, say, a tortoise and maybe a cheetah. <laughs> something like that, or maybe a lightning bolt at the most, but we don't even really understand the speed of a lightning bolt. So when you talk about like uh, Einsteinian uh, relativity uh, or expanding, uh, you know, universe is 13.7 billion years old. I mean, none of this doesn't even make sense intuitively. It's, it's, science has to work hard to get people to grasp what you're talking about. The speed of light, I can't even conceive of what that must be because uh, I'm used to these kind of middling things. So I, I wonder if, 
and because part of the point I think some scientists make is that that's actually good enough for survival. That's all you really need, right? Is a kind of a folk physics about how the world works. Things drop, things fall, things run away, whatever. You know, this the, the, the billiard balls hitting each other. You know, may, maybe technically in physics you could run the film backwards and you can't tell, you know, which time time is direct, which motion time is moving. But really, in in the real world, it's good enough. It works. Well, it is only adaptive, but I think we want to go, the last two years have shown us why we want to go beyond that, right? Why we want to go beyond essentialism and understand real genetics and understand the, you know, COVID and how it works. So we certainly, uh, we want it, it good enough, depending on what your good enough, uh, right, uh, definition is. Well, then I was going to take that to the next step and say, well, whether it's the self is an illusion or free will is an illusion, it works pretty well for me to assume that I am me and you are you and we're two different essences and that you're making free choices and I am too and it feels like I am and you probably feel like you're making free choices. So whatever the world is really like, that's good enough. That works pretty well for uh, you know social primate species to interact with each other and anticipate each other's uh, behaviors, theory of mind, all that, trying to figure out what other people are thinking and then respond accordingly. Even if technically these are incorrect, it doesn't really matter. You know, it works in a, in a pragmatic way. I think the pragmatic uh, choice is we can study certain things and other things we can't, and let's focus on the things that we can understand and can study. Right. One of my favorite examples of essentialism comes from uh, Bruce Hood's research where mm-hmm. uh, he asked people to, uh, what, what, one of them was, uh, would you wear Hitler's sweater, I think it was, or jacket or something like that, or Mr. or Jeffrey Dahmer's sweater, uh, the serial killer, even though he'd had it dry cleaned or whatever, and people didn't want to put it on. Why? The, the essence of evilness is in the sweater, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. something like that, and it could ooze into my, through my skin and into me. Yeah, and, and, and that, I don't know if it's, I, I, I forget, I don't know that it's whoever did the study. Um, the, the fact that we think about this essence as something that is contagious, and usually our notion of contagious is about matter, it's only matter that is contagious, shows that we think about essence in embodied terms as part of the body. Right, so the, the little volleyball on the Tom Hanks movie, um, cast away you know it's it's a, it's a wilson volleyball so he calls it wilson and pr- pretty soon wilson is a thing it's an essence a being a person that he cares about and you know i thought that, I, I i like that example because i think it's true i think that we do do that mm. uh we embody objects with uh, essentialism or whatever you want to call it it's, it's like another agent maybe it's agency but, but furthermore we think that the essence is something that lies within the body because Contagious, con- con- contagion is usually something that we associate with bodily fluids, for instance. The fact that the sweater for that person can exert the same contagions means that we think about con- contagious uh, process as a uh, part of the body. And so the essence is part of the body, and therefore it can create disgust like any other bodily um, fluid source. Do you think this could, just speculating, do you think this could be behind uh, vaccine hesitancy or even the anti-vaxxers? Because, you know, the idea of injecting yourself with a contagion doesn't feel intuitively good. Yeah, no, I I think it's more serious than that. I mean, it might uh, might contribute to that, but it it is probably more serious than... than... You mean more political or what do you mean? Hmm. Yeah, I think so. But I was thinking about that. Just maybe it's multi-causal, anti-vac, the vaccine hesitancy. But like, if I said, you know, just the emotion of disgust triggered by bodily effluvia, like vomit or feces or whatever, I said, well, um, we have this cure for this particular disease. We're going to inject your body with a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of your feces. It would be like, oh no, no, you're not. That's just disgusting. I, I, I do not want that. Yeah. Right. But and it, it, maybe it's something like that. Like you, you want to inject some disease in me, the virus, you know, partial half dead virus or whatever you want to say it is. I don't know. That doesn't feel right. 
Well, yeah, that that's only doesn't help. I mean, if you think about some other species or, or organisms' essence that gets into your essence, then yeah, that that feels like you're being invaded in some way. But again, I don't, I I doubt that that's really the the main part of main explanation for that. Mm hmm. All right. So talk about how people reason about personality as part of our selfhood or whatever. I haven't looked at how they reason about personality. I've looked at how they reason about emotions. We can talk about yeah, that. emotions. Yeah. Okay. Do, do yeah. talk about emotions. Yeah. Um. So, the the idea. So maybe to connect it to the rest of the book's thesis. So, um. One big idea in the book is people think that what you know cannot possibly be innate because what you know is not part of the body and what's innate must be part of the body. So if this logic is correct, then emotions should present the opposite, uh, or should generate the opposite prediction. Because in the case of emotions, people intuitively believe that emotions are in the face, right? Or in the body, they think that you know, fear is in your stomach and that uh, happiness you can see on the face. And if you think that what's innate is in the body, then therefore you would be prone to think that emotions are innate. Um, so we've done the studies and that's exactly what we found, that people believe that facial emotions are innate, that they are universal, that they would be recognized by anybody, that if you go to some hunter-gatherer who never seen a Westerner, um, and ask people, they would be able to, those uh, people would be able to identify a Western um, emotion. Um, in fact, if you tell them, scientists believe that emotions are really learned, people still insist that emotions are innate. And the more they link emotions to the body, the more likely they are to think about emotions as innate. So I found it curious also in relation to how professional scientists look at emotions, right? Because a lot of the discussion of whether emotions are or aren't innate is based on the question of, can you detect universal emotion expression? And the question is, why you should assume this? Why you should assume that emotions ought to show in the body, right? Well, one possibility is that people, scientists assume it just because this, you know, it, it's, it's just easy. So if emotions were in the face, if social emotions were in the face and they were universal, then it's something that's easy to see and demonstrate. But if there aren't, should you assume that emotions therefore cannot be universal? Um, evolutionary psychologists at claim to my mind sensibly that there you have no reason to make these assumptions. Why you should uh, broadcast all your emotions and in fact you have good reasons to try to hide them. And you can think of emotions in fact, as computations rather than as facial expressions. So why is it the case that in this field, um, a lot of the literature on emotions is a literature that asks, can we identify emotions in the face? Um, when you look at how lay people think about emotions and you look at how scientists look at that, you see some correspondence. Um, it's not to, for me to say the causality, but I think it's, it's an interesting coincidence at least. Right. So I've followed some of that literature over the years before, let's say, in Darwin's time. You know, he wrote the expression of the emotions of man and animals, and that kind of put it on the map that maybe we can study emotions from an evolutionary mm -hmm. biological mm -hmm. perspective. Then that went out of fashion for the longest time until, like, I, I, I Busfeld, you know, took that camera crew to different places in the world, like Papua New Guinea, famously, mm -hmm. where, you know, the camera, the lens is pointing this way toward you, say, but the actual filming is done that way through a prison mirror mm -hmm. inside the mm -hmm. lens because mm -hmm. they don't want people acting differently because you're pointing mm -hmm. a camera at them, right? So this is his idea of being a little more objective, I guess. So he claimed that, you know, there's certain expressions come up everywhere in the world, you know, like a raised eyebrow mm -hmm. if you're surprised, the yeah. smile if you're if you're friendly, right. the frown or the, mm -hmm. the uh, fright, frightening mm -hmm. or anger mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, and then, uh, you know, Paul Ekman picked that up mm -hmm. and, and ran with that. And it seemed like that was a done deal. And then uh, uh, Lisa Feldman, you quote in mm -hmm. your book, mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it says, oh, no, no, no. And, and, and offers what seemed like some reasonable criticisms mm -hmm. of that research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Comment on, on that. 
So this literature goes back and forth. And there are those who come back at Lisa Feldman and say, you know, no, well, there are some uh, core emo facial emotions that are innate after all. I, I am not following this literature closely enough to determine who is right. It also depends a lot on what task you're doing and how you measure it and what you think is the right task and not the right task. I think for, for my perspective as an external viewer, the question is, why are you asking this question? Why are you invested is this in this problem of can you detect emotions in the face? Why do you assume that's the proper way to evaluate innate emotions? I don't think that mm. makes sense. Oh, interesting, right, because at some point the facial expression is just a proxy for something going on in the mind. Right, the exactly. So a set of computations, so you adjust, so there is this case of shame, um, you, the, the extent that, of shame that you feel depends on who else is shame, seeing you at your shameful event. So, and your sense of shame is adjusted based on, on those uh, um, uh assessments. So really, I think it makes much more sense to think about emotions as computations and think about the computations as something that is innate. But of course, if you think that computations and cognition in general is ethereal and distinct from the body, and you think that only what's in the body can be innate, then of course you can think about uh, innate computations. That's an oxymoron to you. So I don't know if that might explain why uh, uh, there has been so much effort to try to, re you know, either rescue or refute the notion of facial, innate facial emotion. Mm. And I think that just barking at the wrong tree here. Yeah, it could be. Uh, I was thinking of uh, Robert Trivers' theory on mm -hmm. self-deception. You know, maybe if you give off too many cues to your fellow tribe mates that you're not trustworthy, you're a liar, you're deceptive, and so on, uh, you may be out of the group or, you know, less successful. But if you believe the lie, then the cognitive computation of keeping track of both the lie and the truth goes mm -hmm. away if the, tr the lie becomes true in your mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore, you're less likely to give off those body mm -hmm. language cues mm -hmm. that your, your fellow group mates may pick up on. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm convinced that a lot of cult leaders or, you know, just Con, mm -hmm. con men or whatever probably come to believe their lie at some point because mm -hmm. it helps it makes mm -hmm. it makes them better salesmen for their product that they're selling mm -hmm. uh, if they believe it mm -hmm. yeah yeah but so it does I come guess down the, to the yeah. internal state mm -hmm. yeah right okay so let's talk about the afterlife then so it, would that be an example of kind of a universal innate Sense, since it, pretty much everybody in the world has some kind of belief in an afterlife, that would suggest that that sense of dualistic self that continues on beyond the body is yeah. part of our nature. So methodologically, I don't think that everything that you find across cultures need to be innate. You need to be careful in what you identify as the innate cause of the behavior. So everybody can have a coke these days in the universe, in, in, on earth, right? right? But the, this is obviously not innate. Um, beliefs in the afterlife are very common across cultures. Um, uh, that is exactly what you would expect by dualism. But as we have discussed, I don't think it's necessary to assume that dualism itself is innate, but rather that what's innate are the, the components, the, the engines of dualism. But that is indeed what, what would make you believe that you continue to persist without your body. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, you can't conceive of yourself not existing because to conceive of anything, you have to be existing, right? So yeah. almost literally impossible. Uh, so you could see how everybody would construct some kind of a continuation after the death of body. We can all see that the bodies, people die. 100 billion people lived and died before us, and they're all gone. We can all see that they haven't come back. So that seems real. You know, this is the, uh, the you know, death awareness. Um, what's, it, what's it called? Um, the, you know, the theory of death awareness. That's not the title, but you know, that, that it leads to this kind of existential angst. And so we do things in our, our culture and our personal lives to kind of deal with that terror management theory. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that is a derivative of that, that cognition. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about, uh, you have a long chapter on free will. How do people reason about their own free will versus that of others? Uh, this is something that uh, uh, I primarily summarized the works of other. I don't think that this is really the most uh, original contribution of, of my book, but uh, the point is, again, to show how... Uh, we deceive ourselves by uh, uh, making assumption and trying to um, uh, interpret our, um, uh, especially the role of, uh, you know, beliefs about uh, morality and, and its association with the mind rather than the body and, and the tools that this is uh, creating. Right. Okay, that's kind of a short version like let's kind of drill down on that a little bit because it's an interesting commentary on the free will determinism problem i don't think it's resolvable in any sense because the i think it's a conceptual problem that is it's a problem with our concepts Uh, what do you mean by free what do you mean by determined you know and can a can an agent in a determined universe make volitional choices what do you mean by choices right so maybe here your meta analysis how people reason and think about yeah. Free will is as good as we can get. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's important to uh, recognize the biases that go into that and uh, in particular how uh, a dualist bias can uh, lead you to misinterpret, say, evidence from the brain. Um, so, yeah, I, I can uh, send you back to the book to, to look at that further. Hmm. So, and then uh, talk about theory of mind a little bit and how that you know, affects your, your, your analysis and your research here. What, what part of our in, psychology does that come into play in? In general, how it feeds into my book or... Uh, or just anything. Yeah, just comment on that. I mean, it's one of the more interesting aspects of psychology, I think, touches on a lot of the different topics you're covering here. Well, I think the theory of mind is is one of the engines of dualism. So this this book is really an attempt to say. So so I started this whole thing trying to understand empiricism, where we think knowledge comes from, and the answer that I said is here are these two crayons that you use to um, paint your picture of your mental life. One is dualism, and the other is essentialism. And what I tried in this book is say, okay, once you understand that you have these two crayons in, in, at hand, what other pictures might these two crayons be responsible for? And then I'm going through several other cases and show that you paint those pictures by the interaction of those two colors, so to speak. And the way I see the contribution of this book is there's a lot of previous research that looked at dualism. There's a lot of previous research that looked at essentialism. What has not been previously noticed is these two principles are actually in tension with each other, because you think that dualism claims that some abilities are only in the mind and essentialism claims that what human nature must re- reside in the body, and that predicts a tension that ought to manifest in many other phenomena. And um, what I try to do in this book is demonstrate all the cases where we paint these pictures using those crayons. Um, and uh, theory of mind is, you know, so if, if one is, think about my, one of my crayon dualism and as being like a green crayon, well, this is really the uh, blue and yellow, uh, meaning uh, this notion of dualism, which looks to us as um, atomic, is really not. It's really construed by the tension between intuitive physics and theory of mind. So that's how theory of mind feeds into my argument. So in this book, there isn't much discussion about theory of mind per se, but only to the extent that it informs dualism. Mm. Right. Well, you, but you kind of have to assume something like that to interact with another language speaking uh, concept forming primate, <laughs> you know, that, yeah, of course. You know, I, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, 
or otherwise we don't really have a, the same kind of social life that we have. All right, one of your more original sections was on health and disease and, and insanity and mental disorders, dyslexia and so on. Mm -hmm. So just talk about that for, for a little bit. So, uh, I guess, so, so again, another thing that, that you see a lot in the press is people are claiming, we can see dyslexia in the brain. Well, where else is it going to be, right? Uh, a person learns how to read and it actually changes their brain. Well, where else would you find it? Um, so uh, the, again, it's this, this dualist notions that colors how we think about health and how we think about disease. And um, so in my lab, we, have start, we decided to look at that. So um, we ask people, um, you know, suppose you have a person that shows symptoms of depression and you're going to uh, diagnose them in one of two tests. One t and the two tests, uh, they present people with happy faces versus uh, uh, sad faces and you observe their responses and you detect the responses either by looking at the brain responses, say by EEG or if you're looking just at electric activity, it's not even going to tell you specific localization on the brain, basically on or off. Are you responding more to the happy faces or not? Or looking at response time, are you responding faster to the, the happy faces? And in both cases, the, the, the diagnosis comes, the person is responding in a way that's consistent with depression. And then you ask people, so how likely is it that the person has this depression? And how likely it is that the depression is inborn. So if you know uh, you had a twin that was raised in isolation, would they show the same symptoms? And the answer is, if the diagnosis comes from the brain, people interpret it differently to how, if it comes from behavior, even though the results are completely identical. So if the results come from the brain, people think that the disorder is more, the depression is more likely to be innate. It will not change away. It will not, uh, it will not respond to, uh, to treatment. Um, it's unlikely, uh, uh, it's likely to be uh, uh, in their twin. Uh, you don't want your sister to marry them. So you have some uh, apprehension. You feel that their, their essence is somehow tainted. And Again, it's these two crayons that explain it, right? Because A, why do you think that the results of the brain are different than the results of, um, uh, of the behavior that are completely logically identical? But if you believe that your innate essence lies in the body and the brain reflects the body, then you think that the brain more likely to reflect on your hidden essence of who you really are and therefore speaks to your innate properties. And that's completely baloney, right? This is wrong. Science, you know, neuroscience can tell you about acquired traits and about innate traits. There is nothing in seeing in the brain that distinguishes whether the trait is innate or not. But lay people assume that if it's in the brain, then therefore it must be innate. And if your essence is different and it speaks to your essence, and if your essence is different from mine, then um, you know, I don't want to associate with you and, and so forth. So all these misconceptions are coming from assumptions about uh, dualism, right? Mind is separate from the body and essentialism, this notion that the essence, the real essence is only in the body. Um, that explains why people uh, have these misconceptions, which are, are pretty tragical. So in fact, um, this speaks to, you know, that there has been a, uh, this attempt to try to make psychiatric disorders a disorder like all the others. So the idea was, Let's tell people it's just in the brain. Now, the Surgeon General tried to do so, and the hope was we will combat misconceptions, we will combat stigma, but it turned to have mis, uh, to have fired act, uh, backwards. And in fact, in some ways, uh, stigma increases, and I think that these results explain why is, it, why is it the case that stigma increases, because you think that if you look at the brain, then you some, somehow magically look into the, a person's essence. And um, in fact, they think that the brain is more likely to do so than other methods because they think they're also dualists. So again, these two crayons explain this really unfortunate misconceptions that people have about psychiatric disorders. 
in the case of dyslexia, it's the opposite problem. So um, we know what dyslexia is. Uh, dyslexia can actually arise from multiple causes, but in the majority of people, what's wrong actually has to do with the processing of speech sounds and linking letters to sounds. So it's a lot about speech and a lot about sounds. It's a lot about knowledge of how to link them together. But when you look at lay people and ask them, what do you think causes dyslexia? They're telling you it's a visual problem, it's letter reversal. That is really the real cause of dyslexia for which there is actually very little evidence. There might be some people for which that's the case, but that's certainly not the majority. So the question is why people assume that visual problems are more likely to be the true explanation for dyslexia. And the answer is, you think that if the person really has such a serious disorder that and they correctly assume that the disorder is innate, which indeed it is. So for it to be innate, it must be in the body, and uh, vision can be in the body. You can see it with your eyes, but how can something like linking letters to sound, how can this abstract process could possibly have some innate basis? So how anything that has to do with knowledge and its manipulation has an innate basis, people think that is not possible, so they jump to the conclusion that um, you know, it's, the, the problem is really uh, visual. Uh, and if, in fact, you know that the problem is what it is, which is processing speech sound and linking letters to sounds, and you think it can't be real, it must be in the person's head, it's all an invented problem, which some people unfortunately still think. So you have these two competing misconceptions that are both wrong. On the one hand, people think, oh, if it's visual, then it's really innate. Well, it's innate, but it's not visual. Or they think, if it has to do with letters to sound correspondences, making those links, which in fact that's mostly part of the problem, people don't think this could possibly have an innate basis. So it's kind of in the way the neurologists call these things, it's a double dissociation. You see how the same principles lead to opposite conclusions depending on um, whether people think uh, a problem lies in the body or they lies in the mind, but critically that they make this distinction, I think is remarkable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought of a good example of that from Adrian Raine's book, The Anatomy of Violence. And he makes the argument that it's all, it's all brain violence, brain driven, but how we interpret what is going on in the brain very much affects how we treat these people. So, Two hmm. examples I've used before. He starts off with Mr. OFT, Mr. Oft, who's uh, this anonymous middle-aged school teacher who uh, suddenly his wife, he's, he's married to a woman, already had a daughter, finds that he, he's being inappropriate with the stepdaughter. So he gets in big trouble for this, and um, she, you know, I think he, she turned him into uh, protective services, child services, and he's evaluated by a psychiatrist and so on. And just as he's about to haul, be hauled off to jail for, you know, you know pedophilia, um, he, he pees in his pants, standing there, like, in the corridor with the psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist is like, what's wrong with this guy? This is bizarre. Let's get a brain scan. Sure enough, he's got a tumor in his orbital frontal cortex. So that's where the OFT comes from. Oh, he's got a tumor. Oh, well, that's different. He's not really a pedophile. He's got a tumor, right? It's a, it's a medical condition. And then the, the tumor is re re retracted, and he's fine, back back to life, normal. And then six months later, the wife finds kitty porn on his computer, bam, scan the brain again, the tumor's grown back, and so on. Then Adrian Rain says, okay, so first of all, there's, you know, okay, we don't think of him as like this evil pedophile. He's just a victim of a medical condition. Mm -hmm. Then the second case uh, is this um, young African-American male named Donta Page, who was uh, convicted, tried and convicted um, for rape and murder of a college-age kid, a woman in Colorado. And so he's on, uh, in the penalty phase of the trial, Adrian Rain is on the defense, uh, de defense to try to get him life imprisonment rather than executed. And his argument, which goes on for like three pages of this guy's background, this young African-American male was, you know, born of a single mom who was herself drug addicted, and her mom was a drug addicted and involved in gangs, men coming in and out of the house who would beat up on little Dante Page when he was a child, head injuries, you know, multiple uh, ER visits because of injuries to the head and so on. 
And basically, this guy's got no prefrontal cortex. You know, it's just bubbling up urges and violence and sex. And hey, he's just totally out of control. But the way it's described for page after page, it's like it's he's just a victim of a horrible environment. It's terrible. I mean, you, you can't see it on a brain scan like you can a tumor. So Rain's point is that it's all tumors, but you can't see the upbringing, right? And that, you know, that we treat these people differently based on where we think the the problem is located. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I mean, you can, I, I don't know if that would, that almost feels like the kind of experiment that one needs to do to have a vignette in which people are presented with two people that have some criminal behavior. In one case, the problem is localized in the brain and the other is distributed in the brain. And if you think about one's essence as this little piece of matter, you would actually make the prediction that even though both are in the brain and if even though both have a physical cause, people would think that um, the localized one is more likely to be considered innate and therefore uncontrollable. Um, so that actually is completely in, in line with what we know from intuitive psychology. Mm, interesting. Well, Adrian Rain's long-term goal with this whole project is in a century or two from now, we will have the equivalent of the brain tumor causing the pedophilia behavior for everything people yeah. do. You know, it's just this series of neural networks. It's complicated, and we'll have brain scans that could see these networks lighting up for everything. And that, therefore, it's almost a sci-fi, you know, Stephen K. Dick-type novel um, uh, where, you know, we can predict the violence before it happens, right, and, and nab them off the street before they commit the crime because of brain scans. Obviously, there's ethical issues there, but that's the idea. Yeah, it, it raises again the question of free will, which is, a, is yeah. yeah. Well, right, because if, if you really think everybody's determined, it's tumors all the way down, or it's uh, background all the way down, whatever, um, then you really can't hold people accountable. Well, maybe you can in a kind of pragmatic way, but really you should just feel sorry for them if they are criminals. You know, they just had bad luck of having been born in this horrible environment or a bad, you know, yeah. tumor in their brain, whatever, just some genetic quirk that you and I didn't have. Um, and that would kind of change the way you think about it. But as you point out in the book, research shows that people that think that like that tend to be less moral or they're more likely to say, well, it's okay to, to cheat because, you know, I have no control over my behavior, right? No, but I, I think there's a, a, the deeper question is whether a punitive, you know, criminal justice system is indeed a, a just one. And, and I think that's, that's a good question. Right, for criminal uh, uh, justice reform. Yeah. You know, how we, uh, uh, you know, what's Especially the point of where, a... Especially where we are right now in the States. I mean, this is unconscionable. Yeah, right, right. Okay, I was also, what else was I thinking about here? Oh, Thomas Saws, you know, that that was that phase that psychiatry went through, or some some sort of fringe psychiatrist like Thomas Saws, that it's, it's none of its physiology or it's, none of its brain. It's all how culture defines deviant behavior or defines it down or defines it as deviant when it isn't really deviant. You know, so therefore it's the context in which the behaviors happen. I, I don't understand the argument, sorry. Oh, his argument is that what you and I might call a brain disorder, mm -hmm. um, I uh, see. in fact, is, is just defined by culture that way. Uh, you know, maybe 500 years ago, you know, the people, somebody who's schizophrenic, they were just kind of weird Uncle Joe, and we just put him on the farm, and he does his thing, and he's okay. Yeah, yeah they were called a prophet, yes. Yeah, we're called a prophet, right? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen this recently with the kind of re, uh, reconfiguring autism and the autism spectrum mm -hmm. as more of cognitive diversity is the term mm -hmm. that's being used now. Uh, so it's not a disease. It's not a problem. It's In fact, it's an interesting, different way of thinking. Somebody like mm -hmm. a Temple Grandin or mm -hmm. maybe even Elon Musk, you know, famously mm -hmm. went on Saturday Night Live and said, you know, I'm the right. first autistic person to yeah. host Saturday Night Live that we know of, <laughs> Right. The implication being there's, you know, a, maybe a lot of creative people are on the spectrum. And, and that's kind of a way of rethinking about those issues. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. 
Iris, uh, give us kind of the, the take home, uh, 30, a uh, picture from 30,000 feet of what your research and your book is and, and, and going forward, how we might change the way we think about human nature to have a more just and moral society. I think that the best advice is start by knowing ourselves, knowing, you know, so hopefully by recognizing these, you know, forces that make us think in this irrational fashion, um, you know, that can do some good. So the examples of psychiatric disorders is one really painful case where, where uh, these biases really uh, lead us astray. So hopefully this, um, what I was trying to basically do is a little bit of psychotherapy in this book, right? See all these crazy things that the crazy thought patterns and, and hopefully recognize them and will help, uh, recognizing them will help stop them and, and prevent us from continuing on this path. It'd be interesting to come back a century from now or 500 years from now. Like we look back on the Middle Ages or the early modern period before the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution of how people conceived of human nature then or witches or demons or you know possession or whatever they, they they thought and we look at that and go boy that's ridiculous we have a really scientific theory of human nature now maybe 500 years from now they look back on us and go boy they were so primitive they didn't understand x or whatever <laughs> well we already see that <laughs> right that's true all right, Iris, thank you so much. The book, again, is The Blind Storyteller, How We Reason About Human Nature. Uh, and that was quite enlightening. Uh, thank you. Reasoning pleasure about talking. this is... Pleasure talking <laughs> to you, Michael. Thank you.